Today's reading comes from John 18, verses 33 to 38. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. Uh, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you for the gift of your song and enriching our time together. We are continuing in the sermon series based on the phrases in the Lord's Prayer. And today we'll consider thy kingdom come. Now as John Dominic Crossan uh, begins his chapter on this phrase of the Lord's Prayer, he uses an image that I suspect will be lost on all United Methodists everywhere. He talked about the wine glass of history. So for those of you, no, no. <laughs> Quoting a couple of Roman historians, uh, one who was very pessimistic, who spoke as if all the empires that had happened in the world prior to Rome were much better than the Roman Empire, that history was going from bad to worse. The wine glass of history was not only half empty, but it was getting less and less full with every succeeding generation. No doubt you recognize that sentiment, for we hear it frequently, even today. The second historian was a bit more optimistic. He believed that all the empires that had been before Rome were a steady improvement, and that the Roman Empire itself was the apex of human development and that the Roman Empire would endure forever and ever. The wine glass of history was half full and getting fuller by the day. Crossan says the biblical writers were neither optimistic nor pessimistic, for them, it's not so much that the wine glass was either half full or half empty, as much as the wine glass itself is cracked, leaking, and desperately in need of repair. When Christians think of the kingdom of God, it is neither a statement of optimism nor pessimism, but an acknowledgement that there is a power beyond us that is at work, a power beyond us that we are invited to cooperate with. Now, the idea of a kingdom was very prevalent. 
indeed through all of the history of the biblical times there were kingdoms all around the nation of Israel there was Egypt to the south Assyria and Babylon to the west the Persians a little further to the west the Greeks and the Romans to the north and through the long epic of Israel's history each of these kingdoms would rise up and either conquer or threaten Israel so when they spoke of kingdoms it was with dread and with fear so when the phrase the kingdom of God is used it is used as a way of intentionally contrasting the dangerous and militant kingdoms of the world with something far more noble far more beautiful the kingdom of God the kingdom of God is is what the world would be like if God sat on the throne if God made all the policies that governed human life Crossan suggests that perhaps the best way to understand the kingdom of God is God's great cleanup of the world that God by God's power would cease the things that harm us and God by God's power would lift up and make more possible the type of human interactions that are affirming and supportive of human life Crossan suggests three things about the kingdom of God that I think are truthful and helpful. The first is that the kingdom of God is not some future event that will happen for us later. That the kingdom of God begins right now in the very present moment in which we live that God begins the work of cleaning up the world in the life of Jesus of Nazareth the kingdom begins as Jesus walks across the world teaching a way of love, of acceptance, of humility, of patience. The kingdom of God is not some future gift that we will passively receive, but it's something that's beginning in the present moment when we choose to live faithfully by the wonderful teachings that Jesus gave. The second thing Crossan says about the kingdom of God is that it is non violent. That Jesus never, ever, ever advocated or blessed or encouraged his followers to behave in a way that was violent. We remember the very night that he was arrested when they came to take him and one of his followers pulled out a sword ready to defend Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane and Jesus bid him to put the sword away saying if you live by the sword you shall die by the sword.
Nowhere in the gracious life of Jesus do we have a record of him behaving violently. And the only time he gets even close is the cleansing of a temple, which I think is much more of a disciplined protest than a tantrum of violence. The kingdom of God, God's great cleanup of the world, is a nonviolent activity. And the third thing that Crossan says about the kingdom of God is that it is a collaborative endeavor. That is to say, that God invites you and I to collaborate with God in the creation of what ought to be. That we are given a piece of that important work for the future. And Crossan has coined a very helpful phrase that I'd like to share with you. Without humans, God will not clean up the world. And humans, without God, cannot possibly clean up the world. That the endeavor of faith is to collaborate with this gracious God who wants to clean up the brokenness and the shards in which we live. The kingdom of God is an event that begins in Jesus and continues. The kingdom of God is nonviolent, and the kingdom of God is collaborative. God gives us each a part to play. I thought what I'd like to do for a few moments is look together at that passage of scripture that Amanda read for us, Jesus standing before Pilate, and we can see each of these elements of the kingdom present in that encounter. The first is that Jesus stands before Pilate precisely because he has begun the divine cleanup of the world already and those who benefit from its mess want the mess to continue. So Jesus is there before Pilate, condemned or being condemned for doing good things. Secondly, Jesus does not respond to Pilate with violence. Pilate asks, Are you a king? And Jesus says that my kingdom does not come from this world. If it came from this world, my guards would fight you the way the guards of every other empire for centuries after century had fought. But Jesus stands before Pilate committed to nonviolence, choosing to be killed rather than to kill. The kingdom is nonviolent. And finally, the collaboration is visible because Jesus says he came to testify to the truth.
and as he testifies to the truth. Pilate does not know what to make of him, and Pilate asks, what is truth? Well, my friends, the kingdom of God is built on neither optimism nor pessimism. We are neither optimistic nor pessimistic. We appreciate human nobility, but we do not live our lives by only its light. We are suspicious of human sin, but not made cynical by it. We trust in something more than unaided human efforts. And we share in a divine cleanup of the world that is begun in Jesus, that is not violent, and calls forth from us our very best. That's what it means to pray, thy kingdom come. Amen.